Hi, everybody. Uh, it's me live. Who's going to start us off with an intro for himself and his book? I am. Okay. okay. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> My name is Ben Aronovich. I write books, which is great because it's basically someone to pay you to do something you would have done anyway, and it's brilliant and you don't have to go to work, which I hate. I hate work, always have done. Um, I write the Rivers of London series, which is a series about a police officer who becomes an apprentice wizard and is basically the second person in a, in the very, very small uh, magic uh, area. Ah! section that deals with magic god i really hate doing this uh shenanigans is you i can't try writing serious but it keeps getting all funny um all sorts of things happen mostly in london but i do occasionally leave the capital to go places there you go is that enough Brilliant. that's perfect <laughs> and you um you started off writing for doctor who is that right Yes, well, I mean, that was my first gig. I was actually writing. I really lucked into that through a process of, of persistence um, and canniness and, and luck, basically. Uh, uh, my very first gig was writing for Doctor Who before it was fashionable. <laughs> so it's like everyone goes, oh, I wrote for Doctor Who. I go, no, I wrote for it, but nobody liked it. And um, that was a lot of fun. And then that career sort of went away and I started writing books. I mean, there's quite a large gap of miserableness between that point and the other point um and i wrote i started writing books and that's basically i mean i basically learned to write writing doctor who novelizations because people would actually pay me to write novels and stuff and so therefore that's that's quite rare so um yeah doctor who i can't just uh i'm not very good at these kind of video things i'm much better with an audience i have to i'm much better with an audience come and see me if you're available if i'm available for audiences you are <laughs> excellent with an audience because i've been seeing you at waterstones i think a couple of times i'm i'm just really much better than i i enjoy i really suffered during lockdown i mean in some ways in some ways i didn't suffer at all because, you know, oh no, I can't leave my house. I must sit here and write. Oh dear, what will I do? Um, but in other ways, I kind of miss people. I miss meeting people quite a lot during lockdown. Okay, you know, you don't really know you're going to miss people until they're not there, and then you miss them. I'm not, I'm not a live in a small cottage on a moor somewhere kind of person. Like some people are. I'm looking at you, Rickman. <laughs> <laughs> so what gave you the inspiration for peter and uh basically it was basically the, the initial idea was uh, uh what would happen if gandalf joined the sweeney um which dates me on so many levels <laughs> and uh i like the idea of i like the idea of a sort of like a, that, that kind of like you know we're the we're the sweeney we haven't had our dinner kind of i like i just like that idea of that kind of chirpy Cockney kind of um, uh, uh, police vibe, coupled with magic, so that there would be people who would like, "Oi, you're knit," you know. Rather like uh, Men in Black when when Tommy Lee Jones goes out and says, "Raise all your appendages and the other ones to the to the guy who's a, an alien." I just like the idea of some people who would take this kind of thing as like every day. Oh no, not another vampire! Get the stake, you know, kind of thing. So. That was kind of, I, I sort of demythologized, sort of a, or more precisely, a fantasy of the everyday. That was what I was kind of aiming for. And um, it didn't quite go where I thought it was going to go. So it becomes slightly different from that. But that was the initial impulse. And then I just kind of noodled around until I had an idea. And I went out and I was working at Waterstones Covent Garden. And I stood under the arch. Uh, at what is not the front of the Axis Church because it's the other end, and the, and it said here was uh, the first recorded performance of, of Punch and Judy, and a little light went ding 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 ding, and uh, I went from there. Excellent. Excellent. A question that I most don't want the answer to and do is how many books have you got planned in the series i don't have books planned in the series i'm not doing an ice and fire uh, i'm not doing a trilogy that's got a slightly overwrought um i will write them until people stop reading them probably 
I can kind of see an end to it, but it's not anytime soon. So, and I have no idea how many books that way that is. So I'm just gonna just keep going until I, you know, until really it, it stops being fun. I run out of ideas, or people stop buying them, and that that's the end point. Or I die. Obviously, if I die, then that's the end point too. You know. I may veer off and write. Uh, the tempo of the actual Rivers of London books may slack off at some point, but not anytime soon. I'm not a very fast writer. People think I'm getting slower, but I've, I've never been that fast. At the moment, I'm writing really quickly, but that's by my standards. By a lot of other writers' standards, I barely, you know, like bloody Pratchett was coming out with two books a year. <laughs> freaking years and years and years and years. Don't think I'm ever going to get up to anything like that. I feel like they do come out at a reasonable pace, though, because you have the novellas as well. If it wasn't for the novellas, you'd really notice the gaps. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, we've got some hellos. We've got hellos from Sam, uh, Julie, Hi, Sam. Andrew. Julie and Andrew. Uh, someone whose name I can't see, who just says Facebook user, and Carol. Hello, Facebook user and Carol. <laughs> Um, the so, Facebook user, the only Facebook user. If they haven't site like commented before, sometimes it does just come up as a Facebook user, and we've not worked out. Oh, okay. Why it why it does that? To be honest, anonymous, stand forth, ask a question, come on again. Ah, uh, so Julie's got a question for you. She says you've probably been asked it before, but which is your favourite London hidden river? Oh, it's the Fleet because that's my home river. That I literally have lived on the virtual banks of the fleet most of my life, at one end or the you know one side or the other. Um, and when I go up on the heath for walks, I'm always walking over it. I mean, when in the a uh, couple of winters back when it's very remember that very rainy winter that we had, you could actually actually kind of literally springs that had not burst out of the side of Kite Hill started whooshing. You could actually suddenly see where she'd carve little mini valleys out of the side of Kite Hill and things like that. And then she was, she was getting very frisky. We could have been in a lot of trouble. But, you know, I like the fleet. She's, she's my favourite. As a character, though, i got to say Lady Ty. I mean, of, of the of the rivers in my books, Lady Ty is my favourite. Although followed closely by Beverly and Nikki and Fleet. I love them all. But I'd say Lady Ty. I had the most fun writing Lady Ty anyway. Is that because she's so, like, much of a badass? Yes, that's because she's just like, you know, I take no prisoners. And she's just very stroppy. And um, stroppy characters are fun to write. You know, that's why Stephanopoulos was fun. That's why SeaWorld is fun. Characters who just come out with stuff. When you're writing them and you don't have to have a, you don't have to have a build up. You just have them come out with stuff straight away because they're in a bad mood. That's kind of fun, you know. I like that. I like Lady Ty. And she's a contradiction. There's there's elements of Lady Ty that we haven't explored yet that go back to her history and, and what she was doing when she was younger and things like that. That we've hinted at. That she saw X ray specs, you know, live and things like that. So I I I I you know, I love them all. I love all my characters, even the ones that nobody else likes. So you made Seawall the kind of stereotypical, grumpy northerner. Well, he's, he is and he isn't. You see, Seawall, see, that's an act. Some of that's an act, <laughs> Seawall. He was actually based on someone who was like that. I mean, he was based on this very, very profane friend of mine who came from Glossop. That's why Seawall's from Glossop. And he came from Glossop. And he, and he unfortunately, he died just before I started writing the book. And the first book is dedicated to him. And... Um, I I I based just basically based this. I mean, he was huge, this huge guy, um, terribly posted present, massive Doctor Who fan, could do a fantastic bloody impression of of um, of Tom Baker. And if you've ever met Tom Baker in real life, he swears constantly, and he he would just do this Tom Baker voice that you're used to, sort of like a mellifluous voice coming up, being you know Doctor Who, <laughs> just effing and blinding. It was bloody brilliant, and. I, uh, so I, that's where SeaWorld basically came from. But he's he's not what he's you know, a lot of that is that he's an old he's a he's a very modern police officer playing a very old fashioned police officer on television. If you see what I mean, he's like 
he's he has this act but actually underneath he's actually a very modern police officer and as peter's got to know him and he's got to know peter the kind of relationship has changed you got some more comments judith graham saying she's loving the series oh good I'm so, I'm just started reading them Steve has just joined us from um california it's very exciting to see you all right hello california it's dark. Why is it dark? No, I can't be dark. It's still day. What time is it in California? You will answer, I think. Uh, you've been asked if your books are on audio. You've got really good audio. Uh, my books are all on audio. Totally all audible, um, not on audible. Uh, the other one, which for that one is. And yeah, well, that was very lucky. Audible really shot up. We were, we, we're riding the crest of the the audible revolution not the audible revolution but the audiobook revolution when i started whether or not you had an audio was a kind of like a, oh i don't know if we're going to do an audio now all books have to have an audio because people demand it uh and uh, i actually sell i've always oversold in audio which i put down to cobner holbrook smith to be honest who i pray never gets too expensive um because you know when i started we were both unknown now he's obe he's oh, i have won awards i appear you know every so often i'm like watching a movie and like suddenly oh my god it's cobner he's in this movie how many movies is cobner in and um so uh yeah so the audio has been very good i mean he's done a very good job on that and i think it's helped push the audio so as a result i'm i'm generally considered to be like a pioneer of audio i'm i'm considered to be a pioneer of quite a lot of things at the moment which i actually wasn't a pioneer of or did on purpose and i always just i just learned to just know and go yeah totally totally wanted to take the audio market and that's what i did there yeah totally my idea so yeah, before I ask you the next questions that come out, it's 11 a.m. in California. Yay! Get up, lazy bum. Why are you at work? <laughs> uh, what are well, you, you are at work. You're watching this on headphones, but keep an eye out for the boss. <laughs> what are you working on at the moment? I'm working on uh, a novella. I had, I had two more novellas to go, and I decided to... Um, finish them back to back so that the, that contract would because the, the contract was very late and so I decided to finish them back to back to finish that contract so that people I was one less contract to worry about and also because um, I need to go and do some research on or for the next book out of London quite quite far north out of London in fact so um, I wanted to do that in the summer because no, there was no way I was I was researching Aberdeen in January. That just wasn't going to happen. So I want to I want to research. So I thought that would make more sense, and then it gives more flexibility to the publishers as well. They can choose whether to break up the novels with the or have two novellas or whatever works for them, and that makes them happy and keeps them quiet. So I'm basically working on the last of the contracted novellas which is the Nightingale novella set in 1926. Um, and that's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. I basically, it's basically P.G. Woodhouse. So it's basically Bertie Worcester meets meets the folly. If you imagine <laughs> Bertie Worcester is a magician, that's basically what it is in New York. And But, you know, it's that's how it started. And then, and then you start to do research and you start to find out about all sorts of fascinating things and and they just keep going oh i want to be in my book or i want to be in your book you know, with the novella that's a bit of a pain right because the novella's got a bit of a certain length so uh that's what i'm working on now i finished the the reynolds novella and i've handed that in i'm just waiting for my notes on that one so after that so at some point the notes will come back and then i'll, I'll have to revise the notes on that um so that's what i'm working on and then then in the summer i'll be working on the next novel it's my life. I basically sit down and write, and then when I finish something, I write something else. It's, it's terrible. Oh no, my life is so hard. I'm sure you've been asked this before, but if, would you ever write a Molly novella? Um, I well, I work on the basis of story. If I have a story, I don't think to myself I will do a story about this character. If I have a story, so I didn't say to myself I will write um a. a, a uh, uh, what's a good example? Abigail. I didn't think to myself, I will write a Toby 
uh, Winter's story. I came up, uh, I came up with the story that had Toby Winter in it, and then I wrote it as a novella. If you see what I mean, that's the basis on which I decide to do these things. So, uh, and I mean, sometimes it's a very slim idea of a story, and sometimes it's a very big idea of a story. It, it varies from story to story, but I, I haven't got an idea for a Molly story, not not one that sustains a novella from her point of view. But then, you know. I wasn't expecting um, people that turned up, uh, certain uh, wizards to turn up at the, in the middle of Amongst Our Weapons either. So I didn't expect them to turn up in that book. Any, I'm for half the people in that book I wasn't expecting to see again in that book. So, but, you know, that's like, I, you never know. I might be sitting there one day and I might just go, oh, buddy! And then, like, yeah, there'll be a Molly Lamella. Let's hope there will be. Julie wants to know if you've ever been allowed to walk any of the rivers or sewers. She tried to go down to the Tyburn but wasn't allowed to. The nearest she got was to flag her way down a local manhole. Uh, they they offered, and I said no. Once it wasn't before, they couldn't get anywhere near them. But then I got to a certain level of fame, and um, I phoned them up. And then suddenly, the PR department of Thames Water is much nicer to you because uh, they, they're worried that you're going to write horrible things about them. I think they took that thing where I, I said they would follow as a dread Cthulhu a little bit too seriously. And, um, <laughs> but I, I'm far too vast to go down a manhole and I got a very weak stomach. So I'm not, it just thought it was like a disaster. And so basically, but they did give me a guy who worked down there and he gave filled me in on the safety factors and what it smelled like and everything. And the great thing about being a, a writer is you don't have to do shit. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> You, you just you can describe it and you can use other people's experiences and feed that into the novel and not have to not have to do it so basically yeah <laughs> no i'm not going down i've walked along some of the rivers i've walked along beverly brook i've walked along the, the uh the lee and places like that i do go and have a look hogsmeade and things like that i've gone and walked down the rivers and seen where they come out and things like that to get the feel for the kind of like the locations and stuff but i'm not going down those tunnels they're stinky and I'm too fat. I'm not going down those tunnels. You've been asked if there's a strict progression to the stories, or can I read a dip in anywhere? Um, I would go from the beginning. It would be more fun. It's not a strict. I mean, they're basically, I designed, I tried to design them so that they were like a detective series, so that you have a detective and you have a murder, and then like each book is a detective and a murder, but they got a bit kind of serialized. I'd say. You shouldn't ring, read Lie Sleeping without having at least read Hanging Tree. And really, you'll have more fun if you read them in order. But you don't have to be very strict about it. I mean, you don't have to go, oh, no, I have to read the short stories in the, in the, in the precise order that goes in between the books. No, you can read the short stories out of order. You can read the graphic novels out of order without too much problem. You get a couple of spoilers. I, I myself don't worry too much about spoilers, and so I forget that other people are very sensitive to them. But um, you, you can you can read them. I some people like to read out of order. Some people, I'm I'm a kind of I start at book one, I go to book two, and book three. That's because that's the way I'm, my brain works. But other people' mileage may vary, as they say. I think they're better in order. I think they're better in order. I think you'll have more fun. You know, that's my recommendation. It's not, it's not, I don't think it's essential, but I think you will enjoy them more because the, you watch the characters change. And that's, that's always the fun bit about the series is watching the characters change over time. And, 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 you know, some jokes refer back to things that they did. And the jokes are funny because of the thing you know, what you know about the character. And you start to develop a kind of shorthand. And that's inevitable with anything where you have continuing characters, unless you're, writing 70s television where every episode resets to the beginning at the end you know then yeah something so it's a bit difficult because you read this and there are so many questions i want to ask you but i don't want to give away a spoiler i know it's a terrible thing, I mean, terrible thing. It's silver isn't it lovely and silver it is so like cool. in bookshops and on the interwebs Mine is. Ha ha! <laughs> Find as well. Um, actually, a present from my sister in law who has named her dog after the dog in the rivers of London. <laughs> it's what Toby. Oh, God. 
<laughs> I mean, it's it's a very long chain because I named that dog after the dog in Basil the Great Mouse Detective, who is named the dog after the dog in one of the Sherlock Holmes short stories. So there you go. It's a long chain of dog naming. It is, yeah, all the way down to Toby the dog who lives in Devon. Probably uh, Arthur Conan Doyle named the dog after a, like a dog he knew. It sounds this seems a very natural dog name, Toby. Oh, you've been asked if the Rivers books have been optioned for TV? Uh, frequently, ever since they came out. Um, and tide, it's like the tides, they go in, they go out. One day, the tide will overtop the defences and I will flood the hinterland of, of British television. But at the moment, no, it's, it's, it's been optioned several times. It's currently, people are asking about it, people are talking about it, but... Um, I've stopped worrying about it. I've become zen in the art of television optioning. I sit cross-legged with a pair of symbols going ding. You know, I was, Do you think it's how difficult it would be to adapt? You know, to show sort yeah, of... Yeah, well, especially since, you see, one of the things I did when I wrote the first one was think, yay, I'm not writing for television anymore. I can do what I like. And so, therefore, blew up Covent Garden and had a riot outside. I mean, if you think about... In terms of expense, possibly the most expensive thing is the right outside in Bow Street, where you 150 extras throwing Molotov cocktails over four nights in a in a central London busy street in central London. Yeah, you're going to film that in Bradford with set extensions. Is, is my thinking on that one? <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, it's it's expensive. It's a very expensive show. If it's going to get done properly, it's not going to get done. On, on a bog standard BBC budget. I've got nothing against things with bog standard BBC budgets, but there's, I didn't write something that could be filmed on it. And if you just think about the JAG, you've got to get six JAGs, and those JAGs, it's actually find, hard to find those JAGs. You know, they're actually difficult to find and difficult to maintain and difficult to keep, you know, and you need more than one because you've got to have a backup JAG for shooting. It's going to be a major expensive kind of so slow horses kind of level of financing kind of thing and it is, it's coming you know and that's very rare that means you know streaming money so who knows that's i i it's very popular but it's not really massively popular in the way that sort of like some things you know that get made into tv series are so if you're not massively popular you have to be quite cheap so well we all need to campaign to netflix uh, no, don't not Netflix because they'll cancel me after two seasons. <laughs> Have you got a streaming service you prefer us to campaign to? No, just generally campaign. Just make a lot of noise. I don't. I. I mean, I really don't know how executives make these decisions. I. I think personally that um, they they put all the kind of various books into a big ball and then like put their hand in and pull them out. That's the, the the logic is the way things get made in television is very random. I mean, it appears very random. It's very random because it's they're made up of a lot of people making decisions. So it's rather like Brownie in motion. Ah, see, I was paying attention. It's rather like Brownie in motion. It's rather like you know what Maxwell's demon is. Go on, Okay, the idea that um, Maxwell's demon is the idea that actually because of all the random motions in a molecule, a, a, a nice drink, theoretically through chance an ice drink right all the all the fast moving molecules could concentrate in one corner and one corner of the drink would steam because like all the fast moving molecules because like all the molecules are moving at different speeds different states of agitation and so therefore you could have a cold drink but it would suddenly steam in the corner because of randomly all the all the fast moving molecules would move over to that corner um and uh you see i i pick up obscure pieces of information and television is like that, right? Basically, what has, has to has to happen is all the excited molecules have to rush over into the corner <laughs> and make it of a cold drink, and then television happens. And and the only reason why we think it's easy is because it happens a lot. <laughs> but actually, if you look at the number of projects, uh, the number of projects that get generated every year and have like meetings and people earnestly showing each other things and talking. <laughs> seriously to each other going into development um compared to the number of things that actually get made you'll see what an infinitesimal little number that is and so therefore and but fortunately for me i've done this all from the other side so i've done this all for like 15 years i was in what's called the development spin cycle 
And there are people out there who make a living. They just, all they do, they want to make television, but all they do is kind of develop television and it never gets made. But you can get, you can get paid. You can, you can have a living off that. You know, scripts get written, contracted for scripts, production, pre-production gets put in, and then it just evaporates. Like a sad, evaporating thing. Like a balloon after a party. Or you need the exec to be a big fan. Well, yeah, that you see, that's the well, that's one of the things. See, what happens is if, if sort of like you know, I don't know, Elon Musk or someone likes your TV show, or or probably not Elon Musk because you just end up on Mars. But um, <laughs> if Jeff Bezos sends a note down to Amazon, I quite like this series by this Ben Aronovich, please make it, then the <laughs> you know, that's how things like um, the Lord of the Rings series gets made. You know, for ridiculous amounts of money, because someone said we will make a Lord of the Rings series. I don't care. There's a there's a famous story about EastEnders. I can't remember with the controller of BBC at the time. Said said well, I'm, he said EastEnders. Well, what if it's not a success? He said we will run it until it's a success. <laughs> so you know that's uh, yeah, but I I you can't count on that. You know, I haven't seen any people lurking with bodyguards at the back end of my visits events or anything and i certainly haven't been invented invited to any penthouses yet so or yachts <laughs> we've been asked both of us what our favorite rivers of london book is well my favorite rivers of london book is always the last one i just finished so amongst our weapons oh no uh the one <laughs> the novella before that <laughs> You see, the thing is, by the time your books come out, you're usually either halfway through a book or have just finished the novella. That's the timing of it. So, um, uh, I love them all. I mean, I have my favourites. Uh, Foxglove Summer, I've got a big fondness for Foxglove Summer. There's a lot of... I tend to have favourite sequences. I like Abigail because I love the foxes. <laughs> um... I like Foxglove Summer because it, it, I don't know this. I think I captured the kind of heat of a, a, a British summer. I think a, a kind of a summer in the countryside, which was what I was aiming for. And I felt that uh, you kind of like things that you do. I like um, I like Whispers Underground because the, the amount of underground I managed to get into Whispers <laughs> Underground, and, and I didn't even put the mail rail in. I was going to put the mail rail in, and then I just realised that was like eight chapters of them running around underground. That was just too many. Um, <laughs> Uh, I like the first one because I sat down and I wrote the first five pages and I thought, fuck me, this will sell. Uh, I like the second one because it's got that kind of jazzy kind of, and the descriptions of London, you know, and Soho. Um, I like all of them. I like Broken Homes because everyone, I knew everyone was going to lose their shit at the end. <laughs> so it was like, and also because I always I wanted to have Peter do what he does at the end of that one and, and the, you know all that kind of stuff so i don't want to spoil it for people who haven't read them but i mean i love i love all of them for for various different reasons yeah the fight that was the one where i had the first proper magic fight between nightingale and somebody else and peter's like leslie just like diving for cover and it's like bits of fur, bits of scenery are being thrown around that was a lot of fun i'd been waiting to do that for a while and you know i just i like writing i like the books i like to feel that every book i've never like buff out a book i never i try never to buff out a book just like oh i'm not ed reed in fact i can't do that i can't actually write unless i like the writing which is one of the reasons why i get stalled sometimes it's like you have to like the writing and 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 i love all my books all my children and all my characters possibly abigail a bit more than everyone else <laughs> abigail is brilliant i was going to ask you about the foxes because they're so good and they've got such a rich kind of world like you've invented their own language and codes and timings of the day and things well the foxes came about because i don't know that last line there's a last line in the book of in whispers underground <laughs> and I, I, sometimes when you're writing a story you can see a shape right you can see a shape and you know something goes in like a piece of the puzzle goes in there and it's a certain shape and it has to do a certain thing and you you're sitting there and you have no idea what that certain thing is going to be until you get there and suddenly it just drops into place. And that was 
when Abigail says a fox, a talking fox came up to me and said, you're in the wrong part of London, right? He goes, you're, it's all happening, kicking off south of the river. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> foxes that talk. And then I've got that kind of brain. So I had to think, well, why are there talking foxes? Okay, uh, are they fox spirits? Are they literally mutant foxes? What's what's going on here? Where did the fox come from? So I had to sit down and work out where the foxes came from. Once I'd come up with where the foxes came from, uh, which can sound very rude, actually. Where the fox came from? Um, I worked out their backstory, and uh, when I was writing a couple of... I was writing the furthest station. I was writing the furthest station... And it was a throwaway remark by Nightingale about, like, back, just a bit of throwaway remark about Nightingale. And I thought, aha, that's where the foxes are from. I knew base, I knew roughly where they came from, but I didn't know exactly how that had worked, what the mechanism was. Um, and so it's rather like, you know, they all knew, we all knew evolution was happening. It was Charles Darwin who came up with the with um, selection of the fittest. And so therefore, natural selection. And so therefore, ah, that's how the foxes came from. And then I thought, oh, well, that works perfectly because that happened and it all fitted together. It was like it was meant to be right from the start, but it wasn't. It was something that kind of fitted together. So a lot of the time you get things where they fit together and it's like you meant it to happen, but you didn't really. You just kind of like, oh, okay, that's good. I'll have that. That's fine. They're just like, they come up and they're kind of like the comedic relief a lot of the time, aren't they now? Well, they're a bit like the minions, right? And like the minions, I feel that if I overexpose them, you're all go, everyone will go off of, including me. So <laughs> I try and keep them to the minimum, but they keep trying to get into the stories. I mean, I wasn't going to have them in, you know, I was going to have very minimal foxes in, in amongst our weapons, and, and they just kept on trying to steal seeds. They just get in and try to steal the seed. And so you have to be very careful with them. But yeah, they are like, but they're also very useful exposition monkeys. Because you, you just go like a fox runs in and goes, the king is dead, and runs out again. You see, it's like really... <laughs> They got that real function, and unlike human beings, you see, you don't have. They're not attached to all this kind of baggage, so you can just have like a, a cute fox run in, say something, run out again because it's a fox, and that's what foxes do. If you watch foxes, they run in, they do something, and then they run off again, and that that, that kind of I think that works very well for me. So, uh, I also I just like them, but I I think there'll be more foxes in in, in an Abigail book. I think in a in future Abigail book, I think there'll be more foxes. So. You and know. I feel like Abigail's got a lot more to come as a character. Well, I, think, I think there's a young Abigail strand, you see, because in the main book, she's getting, you know, she's going to university fairly soon, you know, not that far away. And I like Abigail, but I actually like her when she's a stroppy 13-year-old more than I like her when she's a stroppy 17-year-old. So, uh, because you know, when it's stroppy 13, you don't have to worry about certain problems in life. <laughs> It's like you got lots of problems, but they're not the kind of boring adult ones. It's kind of like the proper teenager ones. And so I think, yeah, there's going to be some more what Abigail gets up to, you know, behind everyone's back during like 19, what, 2013, 2014, 2015. It's really weird thinking my brain back to that, the other side of the pandemic and everything. But I haven't quite caught up with events yet. Is that going to happen, though? Will you eventually write a river's book? Um, yes, yes, I have one planned. No idea what it's about, but I know roughly the shape of it. Well, what's going to happen? I, and I know which period it's set in. It's, it's, it's going to be set in that that first period when we went into lockdown and all the animals started running around the streets. Because <laughs> I don't know, I, I can't do something with that. And, you know, because the, 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 you know, the police didn't stop. The emergency services didn't stop. The the health service didn't stop. Everybody else was stuck at home, but there were lots of people running around, having to run around. You know, the vital what was known as the vital services, where where everyone was still out there having to do their jobs and not knowing whether they were risking their lives seriously or not because we didn't really know what we were doing. Nobody had any real idea what was going on at that point. See now we now we look at it it's like well of course it's like a terrible virus that does this and we have these strains but you know we didn't not in, not then I remember it very clearly it was all terrifying and like you had these empty streets it was so weird the air quality in London improved no end <laughs> you know uh, and you'd walk out you'd go for your kind of mandated like walk or walk and you 
there was just no cars. There was, you know, foxes were like sitting there going, where's everyone gone? I feel like the foxes are going to have a heyday in that novel. Well, uh, yeah, and, and I don't know, something else will. I don't know what yet. Something else will have a heyday, and that will probably form the core of the story. Something else will take advantage of the absence of people on the streets, I think. I'm intrigued by the whiteboard to the side of you. Is that how you do your planning? Uh, I Well, yeah, it's not as useful as you think it is. It's mostly got things <laughs> like do the washing up on it. <laughs> But when I'm writing a, a, a lot, well, it depends. It depends on what the novel is like. If I'm writing a novel which is quite complicated, in, in like for amongst our weapons, then it, this got kind of covered in in stuff. If it's a more linear story, then I don't really need the white. But what tends to happen is over here, which I'm not going to show you because it would be spoilers, right? Is I tend to put all the names so that I don't forget the names, and then when I'm revising, I've got, for example, um, on the Reynolds novella, which I, I'm revising at the moment. It's got all the things that Reynolds knows that what Reynolds mentioned, so I, I don't do it twice, and so I can remember what she said about and what she hasn't said about during the course of the story. Because um, you have to, you know, because you have to have a certain amount of explanation for new readers, but you can't have too much, and you don't want to repeat yourself. So I make sure I know what she said and things like that so and what's what's been said to yeah so the clues make sense basically and then also things like um what date certain events happen um uh that i've got here it says cotton gloves which is a reminder that people use that you're supposed to use cotton gloves when handling old documents apparently i've been told by any i i don't care if you're a librarian and you don't use cotton gloves i've been told by my librarian that you use cotton gloves and she will beat me and she's physically able to beat me whereas you're virtual and so therefore i'm going with what she says <laughs> the sons of wayland make an appearance at long last and amongst our weapons well yeah they, they I've, they've always planned them to make an appearance i but i didn't plan I knew they were going to make an appearance in this one because of the subject matter, and um, I didn't. You know, the, the 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 current hierarchy of the Sons of Wayland came as a bit of a surprise, and it's also a tremendous pun, um, <laughs> which I enjoyed immensely. I didn't think of that until I thought, "Oh, who is this person?" And then I thought, "Well, they come from this particular background." Thought, oh my god! Oh, I can make a, I can make a tremendous punny joke, an awful Pratchettian level. But I don't do puns very often, so I really enjoyed that one. <laughs> and um, yeah, and uh, you know that whole thing that that I didn't know that was going to happen until I was about a third of the way through the book, and I, I was mapping out the sequence. And then I went to Glossop, and I went to Glossop, and I, I, I did research at Glossop in Manchester, and I found some of the things that are featured, like the the, the sort of side quest bit that's featured in there. I found all that kind of stuff, and all oh, this has to go in the book. This is just too, this is too wonderful. And and uh, and I found I found the factory and everything. And then I thought, well, where do we go from here? And then I I uh, I thought, aha, we go from here. We have to find this thing. It's, it's really hard to do this without spoilers. And then then <laughs> I'm just basically going. And then this thing happened. And I did this, and I attached point A to point B, tab C. Fitted very neatly into tab A. But basically, yeah, the Sons of Wayland were an idea whose idea arrived at the same time as the story. Like I said, I run on the stories and I go where the stories take me. And a lot of the times the ideas develop as the story develops rather than I have an idea and then I put it in a story. I mean, that does happen, but it's much more likely that I get to a point in the story and I go, aha, this is where we can put this in this can happen here and, and this means i have to develop this part of the world because i i have a rough idea of what the world is like but it kind of if you imagine it's kind of like very sketchy and then when i get the story gets there i start coloring it in and putting in details but that in its process in itself leads to you thinking about what you're doing and then that branches off and that create that then creates story ideas some of which you use in the story you're using now and some of which you put in a big box for later Marked stuff, or as I call it, Chekhov's garden shed. <laughs> so, uh, Judith has asked you if you read when you're writing, not at the same time, obviously. And if so, <laughs> it's not at the same time, I, I listen to tremendous number of audiobooks because usually if I'm sitting down, I'm writing. So, 
most of my reading is done on foot while I'm walking or moving about or traveling, um, which is not research, that's the non-research writing. So reading. So um, I tend to try and read things that are, I tend to read what they call comfort reading when I'm writing because of what, if it's too stimulating, I want to go off and write whatever genre I'm reading. So I have to be very careful. So I tend to read um, detective novels while I'm writing uh, Peter Grant so that I, I, I'm in a kind of detectory kind of mood when I'm writing. Otherwise I'll go off and write, yeah, if I write, if I read space operas or fantasies, I want to go, I immediately want to go off and write a space opera or fantasy or something. And it's like, no, you're writing Peter Grant. Peter Grant is the person you are writing now. Do not write fantasies or space operas. I'm easily distracted. It's a bit of a pain really. So what kind of detect, what have you read recently that you've enjoyed? Oh, I like cozies. I, I don't like grumpy detectives who are drinking themselves into a stupor uh, or like, I don't like serial killer stories where millions of women are chopped up, you know, one every five chapters or so. I don't like those, uh, with the exception of Stuart McBride, because he's funny. Um, I like, I like cozy. So I read, you know, a tremendous amount of Simon Brett, a tremendous amount, you know, I don't like too cozy. I don't like the very artfully cozy ones where they're in the Cotswolds. It's slightly too cozy for me or the, or the South of France or somewhere. I've tried them. I like, mm, I like kind of no, I like mysteries where it's not always the end of the world at the end of every book where, where you have a mystery and you solve it. I like straightforward kind of mysteries. So I like, you know, Charles Paris and things like that. I love Charles Paris. He's one of my favorite detectives of all time because he's just so wonderful. <laughs> and then you write like the very farthest from cozy kind of stories. For, well, yeah, I, I, I write the stories that come out. I don't always know where the story's going. I just follow the story. You gotta follow the story. If you've ever read a book and you thought that's weird, that's because they didn't follow the story. They, they, they decided they wanted to put a happy ending or a sad ending on it. The story goes where the story goes. Sometimes the story, you're about a third of the way, two thirds of the way through, usually you know where the story's going. And you just sit there going, oh no, it's going there. <laughs> that's not gonna be very happy. And, but there's nothing you can do about it at that point. The story is going where the story is going. They're almost like living things. I'm with, I'm, I'm with Terry Pratchett on that one. The stories are real things. Has your story ever gone somewhere that's made you quite sad? Has, Has my story ever gone, gone what? Has your story ever gone somewhere that made you feel quite sad when you got there? Not yet. <laughs> um. I can see a sadness in the future, but I, you know, I, and I'm kind of putting it off. <laughs> I can see sadness, but I, I try not to do tragedy for the sake of tragedy. So I, uh, I mean, apart from anything else, it's unrealistic. Police officers actually don't die on duty in duty, in the line of duty very often. And usually when they die in the line of duty, they, they die from car accidents and things like that, things everybody else dies of when during their everyday life. So um, I, I try not to, I try not, I, so I don't want to over egg the jeopardy element of it, even though Peter's insane sometimes and I think it worries that he's like too bold, reckless. Generally speaking, I don't like killing off characters for, to, you know, to <laughs> encourage the others. So some sad things will happen, but not yet. I don't know. Uh, if it happens, it will happen. So, I mean, I, I feel very sad about some of my characters. I get moved. I can, you know, I can make myself cry writing sometimes. Oh, that's so sad. But it's usually about minor characters or minor details or historical events or things like that, rather than grand character things that are happening to the main characters. I don't know why. It's just my process, I think. That made no sense. I just reviewed that entire sentence in my head. It made no sense whatsoever. I think it made sense. How um how did the graphic novels come about? I wanted to write graphic novels, and I got to the point where I had something I could, you know, I could go up to Titan and go, I've got this IP, it's really successful, let me do a graphic novel. And they said, okay, and they took a chance, and it was successful, and so therefore we wrote more. And there we are. Now I'm, uh, we're getting, we're at the latest one is actually written by 
uh, we brought in some time because we, me and Andrew looked at each other going, wow, we are two aged white men. We need to get some diversity in this. <laughs> at least some women. So, <laughs> you know, so it's, we, we, uh, we decided to sort of try and bring in some more people who want to write graphic novels and, and we gave some, a couple of people who wanted to really write graphic novels and we wanted to give them a chance in the same way that we got a chance writing the graphic novels. So we're giving that a go. So the the latest one is going to be, is not written by me. Um, uh, it's it's I don't know. The graphic novels were interesting because it's a bit like television in that it's a collaborative process and you're not totally in control of it. So in a novel, I'm totally in control of everything that's in the novel. So it's my fault. Whatever's in the novel is basically my fault. But I, you know, there's a lot, of, especially comic book artists. It's really hard to get them to stop putting enormous tits on people like they just it's just like they're programmed and you just that's not where i thought that's you, know, just going. You, just, you just go no you know why do they look like this? They go, oh, just, i don't know it's just that i think they just it's expected of them and a, a lot of our, and you can't to a certain extent you can't control your graphic artists because they like they're working very fast Right, they're writing, they're drawing, you know, twenty-two pages in a in a in a month, which is a very fast rate of progress. Uh, and they will write, they will draw in the style that they draw. And they're all comic book artists. And they all basically became comic book artists. Most of them, as far as I can tell, so they could draw women with enormous breasts. It just seems to be the, their thing. So I'm constantly going, no, no, you know, Galid does not stick out that far. Why is Galid wearing a tight? You know, she's not going to be wearing a skin, and you just have this problem. You just have this problem with the answer. And to be a certain extent, you can't you can't control it. And this is, you know, that's not the only thing. They have a style. They have a style of face. They they you know. You, I mean, I can't draw, so I can't tell them draw someone this way because I'm trying to do describe something that I can't do myself, and so therefore. You, you try and maintain control over key characters and that's it really the rest of them you have to let them get on with it so that that's that's kind of sometimes they do it and sometimes they don't um, but usually you don't have a chance to mess with it particularly once you're in production and so it's like television in that and in television the collaborative process so you're dealing you know television is even worse because you're dealing with like four, 40 to 50 highly trained people who all have their input and they, they it's going to change your it's not going to come out the way you think it's going to come out you think readers have problems writers have this problem where we sit there going that's not what i can see in my head oh. but there you go there's not much you can do about it you just have to accept that it's a different it, that's what happens when you shift media you know so there's a lot of debate about the possibility of a rivers of london rpg well, it's not debate. There will be a Rivers of London RPG. It is coming out probably this year. Uh, I mean, we've written, it's, well, I say we, it's mostly being written um, by other people who know how to write RPGs with me occasionally going, no, yes, no, oh, ooh, that's a good thing. I want to that. Um, it's, it's um it I well yeah it's gonna be a robot it looks beautiful I mean I've seen all the art the art gets thrust past me massive I didn't realize how much art went into a single volume of a role playing game so they like, like uh, for this picture this picture this picture this this picture I was going wow that's wonderful can I have that can I have a print can I have that as a wallpaper it's, it's that's a lot of fun it will be very good it's based on basically it's uh, uh uh, it's what's well, uh, to get kind of very technical. It's BRP. It's the basic role playing as developed for the seventh edition of Call of Cthulhu. So it's uses percentages for the main characteristics, which I don't particularly like. But that's only because I'm really old school role playing game person who remembers, you know, three die six, and you took what you got in those days. You rolled three die six, and you took what you bloody got. <laughs> None of this build your character according to some concept you have you took what you got um and and if you, the people didn't like it that was tough you know, to play what you played what you rolled oh uh, that, that was a long time ago um and so it's it's a nice it's slightly simplified system so it's not as because it's we're trying to avoid putting the stress on combat because in a role-playing game sometimes you the over the stress can be too much on combat and we're trying to 
um, we're trying to make it so it's a detective series, you know, mysteries. Mysteries are hard to write for role playing games, though. So we're, we're creating quite a lot of scenarios for people to use because we know mystery scenarios are actually quite hard to um, come up with on the fly. You know, it's, it's not like, oh, I walk into a room and there's like five skeletons. Yeah, you find the skeletons. You know, in a mystery, you, you have to think ahead quite a long way. And it's hard work for the, for the GM. So. Um, but we also have a slightly more free. We're also going to be providing a um, a, a free style of further supplements for, for example, like an American supplement where you can basically be supernatural and tool around in a in a in a. It's sort of like well, in a very Rivers of London way, you can tool around in a vintage car and 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 deal with things in small towns in Ohio and things kind of way with not very much in the way of structure so one's very kind of policey one's very unstructured because we know that the first thing everyone's going to do is they're going to want to break the system as soon as they see it they go oh we will now break the system ah, you didn't and there will be you know there we have we have rough rules for um the super you know for some things there will be have to be elaborations because you know and then there's a whole german supplement that we'd like to do at some point because germany yay <laughs> This is exciting news. So, you know, I mean, that's assuming anyone buys it. So if you want all these supplements, you have to buy the first one or they won't do it. They're very ruthless in the industry. It's a very low margin industry, so they're very ruthless. I am very open to having a Rivers of London RPG book in my life. It is going to look pretty. If nothing else, it's going to look pretty. <laughs> I have a collection of too many of them as is. I have. If I fortunate <laughs> you can't see them. They're all in boxes because I'm moving house. And so therefore I just went, How many role play? Did I actually buy every single GURPS world book, third edition world book in the entire universe? Yes, I did. Now we may have lost the entirety of the UK Chrome Book Club talking about role play. <laughs> I feel like we might have outgeeked. I am totally geeked. Ha ha! You thought you were a geek, but you are nothing. Nothing. Sorry. I'm going to ask you one of our favourite group questions now, which is what are some of your most memorable moments as an author? <laughs> we don't have memorable author moments. We, we're, we're boring people. <laughs> we work at home, you know. Oh, yeah, that was that time I banged my head on the desk. No, I mean, it's like... My most memorable that as a bookseller, I can tell you, which is when John Cleese came in and me and John Cleese recreated the cheese shop sketch, uh, except with books, until I lost my nerve and ran away. <laughs> He's a very scary man in person. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a North Londoner, so I'm supposed to be kind of immune to star power. Like, oh, yeah, there's Michael Payne. But there's something about John Cleese. He just looms over you in this kind of censorious school mastery kind of way <laughs> and, it's like, ah! and we didn't have a single book that he wanted he was just like list of a book i'm looking up on the computer and it wasn't there we were just basically doing this. at some point i expected him to say is this really a bookshop and i got the finest bookshop in the land and i just ran out of it <laughs> and my manager had to take over because i just freaked out that boringly is the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me <laughs> <coughs> That and having the opportunity to go down and look at the rivers. Yeah, well, I didn't though. You see, if I'd done that, I would have been exciting. But I'm not like something like like Linda Leplant. You always hear Linda Leplant. Oh, I went into a mortuary and I looked at all these bodies, and I go into a mortuary and she blagged her way into a mortuary in Moscow uh, during the '90s, and like there's this horrendous description of her one talk, wandering around this mortuary. I just wouldn't have gone anywhere near that. I, you know, I. They, do you want to come in and see a dead body? No, not really. Nope, nope, nope. Don't want to see a dead body. No, thank you. I have no interest in dead bodies. Write about them. Not, I don't want to touch them, smell them, go anywhere near them. So I don't have an interesting life. I, I, I write about interesting lives so that I don't have to have one. Is basically my basis on the thing. Meeting people, though. That's the most fun. I like meeting people. It's given me the opportunity to travel up and down the country, which I've never done before. I mean, I walked over quite a lot of it on camping holidays, but I'd never 
gone to like places like Manchester and Glasgow and Edinburgh and Aberdeen and Dundee and Inverness and all these places that I've now visited and gone, you know, briefly some places, met people in and interacted with. Um, that's been nice. That's the most best thing about being a writer is it's, it's given me the opportunity. I can now just go, I, I will go to Glasgow and I can just go to Glasgow. I have the time and the and the resources to just go to Glasgow, which I didn't. Twenty years, you know, I couldn't. I couldn't even afford the bus fare down the West End, and then you know, suddenly I can go. Oh, I will go to Paris. Ah, see, Paris, which is actually closer than Glasgow in, in train journey times, you know. Uh, that I like. I've discovered Germany, which I've never been to before, and discovered the joys of schnitzel and currywurst. Currywurst. Perfect. I love curry first. <laughs> see, so these are, you know, but in terms of interesting, we're not an interesting bunch. That's why you don't see biopics of writers. Even Tolkien, and he fought in World War One, and they still couldn't make his biopic interesting. Who's the biopic of Capote? Uh, yeah, well, Capote is a special case. And anyway, he, was, he did reportage, which is a different thing altogether. <laughs> you watch, there'll be another one of you soon. There'll be a, a bad one. There, there won't because one, you know, I, I, I don't think they'll find someone to play me. That's not I'm large enough to play me without wearing objecting to a fat suit. Uh, and uh, you know, Ian McNeese is too old. And um, no, it's because it would be boring. It would be really tedious. I'm just trying to think. What did you do? I, I actually, if I, I like um, Jack Rosenthal, I plan to write my autobiography as a, as a. TV script, but my plan is uh, I'm going to do it as a previously. I'm going to call it previously on Benaronovich, so that I can I can just put in the exciting bits, like five minutes of the exciting bits, and then like leave out all the rest of. Would you have a walk on coming here in like a Rivers of London show? I probably would, yes, as long as it was very walk on. Like you know, you know, I'm basically the same shape as um, uh, as oh that famous director, psycho director, God Hitchcock. I'm basically the same shape as Hitchcock, so I can just walk past the camera. Television show. It's like it's it's like the second coming. You know, theoretically, for Christians, there's going to be a second coming, but I don't think most people don't actually going to think it's going to happen tomorrow. So that's the TV show for me. Uh, you know, theoretically, a TV show is possible, but I, I, I am a man of little faith in that department. You know, <laughs> having said that, of course, it will happen next week. You know, it could. These things happen very quickly, right? There's a lot of faffing around, faff, 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 faff. And then when they do happen, they tend to happen very, very quickly because someone like Jeff Bezos has made a decision and then everyone scrambles to keep up. And then we're suddenly, oh, we've got to write the scripts in five seconds. Oh, and like, oh no. And they all get very panicky. And now you're on TV, so like a, a video saying that you don't believe in it. It is going to happen. No, it's still what happened. If only the universe worked that way. I don't believe in universal world peace. There you go, just in case it does work. <laughs> it's been, we've got one minute left. Okay. As our chat. Uh, lots of people have said that they love your books. I want to go back and just find the comment that came up earlier to read you. They said, thank you for writing the Rivers of London series. I absolutely love how weird and wonderful they are. Thank you. I enjoy writing them and I'm, I'm, I'm just glad people read them. Otherwise, I'd be a bit stuffed, really. And um, yeah, all that's left for me to say is thanks for joining us. Thanks for giving me an hour of pleasure of talking to one of my well, favorite Thank you for having me. I'm trying to look at the camera so that I'm not looking off to one side. <laughs> thanks for thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm uh, uh, well. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be once I've turned off this camera. I will be writing more stuff or playing Civilization Six. It's a toss up really between the two. Um, yeah, basically. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for reading the books. Thank you for buying the books. And I will, I've been an author. You've been an audience, which is my sign off. Thank you.